2 Corinthians 13. Wow. We've come to the end of the book. You know, Paul is about to make his third trip to Corinth. See verse 1? This is the third time I'm coming to you. He's about to make his third trip there. The first one is recorded for us in Acts chapter 18. That's when the church was founded. Paul was the church planter, you might call him. The second trip that he made to Corinth was after he had written 1 Corinthians, that first letter to them. And in between his second trip and this third trip, he had sent Titus and another emissary. And Titus came back, you remember, Paul was very anxious about what he was going to report. But when he got the report from Titus, he was very encouraged. But as we saw in chapter 12 last week, verse 11, there were some bad attitudes that had uh, developed again because he says, I'm being compelled to speak like a fool. You ought to have commended, you ought to have uh, recommended me uh, because I'm not behind any of your so-called super apostles. He feels like he's in competition with these false apostles. And then I hate what he has to say in verse 20 and 21 of chapter 12 as he closes that chapter. He says, I fear when I come, I'll not find you such as I would that I shall uh, be found unto you such as you would not. There's th That there's going to be debates and envyings and wrath and strife back. You got some problems going on, but that's also in conjunction with, he says in verse 21, that uh, I'm going to bewail many who have sinned already and have not repented of uncleanness and fornication Siviousness, which they have committed. And so he's ready to make the third visit, but there are some bad attitudes and some bad behavior that has surfaced. And he's warning them, I don't want to have to come there and, and uh, begin disciplinary action when I arrive. I want this to be a pleasant visit. I don't want to have to do that. Look at, uh, for example, verse 10 of chapter 13. He said, therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destroy. I don't want to come and have to tear you apart. I want to come and help build you up. And uh, so you see his heart. I recently heard the uh, senator from Louisiana. John Kennedy is his name. And he was talking about a particular political figure. And here's what he said. It's not what you say, but what you do that shows what you stand for. It's not what you say, but what you do that shows what you stand for. Well, that's not just true in politics. That's really true in every area of life, even the Christian life. That's really basically and essentially what the Apostle Paul is saying in chapter 13. In this closing chapter, he's saying, you know what? Some of you believers in this church in Corinth aren't really living it. You're not really living up to the Christian life is what he's saying. And that's the reason why in this final chapter, he very importantly begins with an admonishment. You know what an admonishment is? It's a warning. It's a caution. And that's how he begins the first half of this chapter. Actually, the most of it, two-thirds, uh, uh, he, he, uh, up to verse 10. He is warning them. He's cautioning them. And you know what? At the what is at the root of his caution? Their relationship with Christ, their relationship with the Lord. That's what the warning really centers around. How are you related to Jesus? I mean, what's your relationship with him? How is that working out in a practical daily life? 
Are you rightly related with the Lord? That's what he's challenging them about and admonishing them concerning. And so we want to look at the admonishment in the first 10 verses as we begin. Uh, but then I like the way that he ends the chapter. He ends it on a very positive note. He ends it with encouragement. So it begins with admonishment, warning, and ends with encouragement, warning. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to be together. We often just take it for granted, and, and we, we stroll in non, nonchalantly. Lord, I thank you that we have the privilege of public worship without any fear of uh, governmental uh, interference because of it. Lord, this is a, a, a wonderful right that we have as Americans. And I thank you that we can do it in person. This is what the fellowship and worship in the local church is all about. And so I pray that today, as we have come together, that uh, Jesus would be at the center of our thoughts, that uh, he would be the one that uh, our thoughts are centered upon. We meditate on you. Lord, we want to worship you. We want you to gain the preeminence in our time together today. But we do pray that we would also be spiritual uh, benefactors of our time together, that uh, you would touch our hearts, work in them. Show us, Lord, what you have for each one of us. We're here. You know our needs. We're as individuals before you. You have a personal relationship with us. And so, Lord, we just pray that you'll speak accordingly. We just thank you again for your word. We've already heard from it. It's already challenged us. May you continue, Holy Spirit, to accompany your word that it would go forth in the power and demonstration of the Spirit of God to the glory of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. So let's pick it up and uh, look at uh, that first verse again. He says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Well, where does that come from? That goes way back to the Torah, doesn't it? And that was the law, that uh, no one could uh, raise an accusation against uh, another without adequate witnesses to, uh, to corroborate that uh, accusation, whatever it might be. Well, this is his third visit. Uh, here's two or three witnesses, just the number of visits he's made, but he has other members of his missions team as well that uh, can corroborate his, uh, his testimony here. And then he says in verse two, I told you before, and I'm telling you ahead of time, I'm foretelling you as if I were present the second time. And being absent now, I write to them which hereto have sinned and to other that if I come again, I won't spare. Remember, they have bad attitude and bad behavior going on here. We saw that in the end of chapter 12. And so he says, I'm coming. And when I come, I'm going to have to deal with this head on. I'm going to confront it as it needs to be confronted. And uh, it's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. And then he says this in verse 3. Since you seek a proof of the Messiah speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you, talking about Christ, in him, in them, for though he, that is Jesus, was crucified with weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward. Here again, in the very final chapter, is that same theme and motif that I think runs through the whole letter. And that is, through weakness, we are strong. And the key example is Jesus himself, who in his crucifixion really epitomized weakness. But in his resurrection, he epitomized his power, great power. And uh, so his warning, first of all, in verses three and four that I've just read, is uh, I, I said it is all about the relationship with Christ and what he's saying in verses three and four 
is all about Christ in him, Christ in the apostle. That's what he's talking about here. He's saying, you as a church, you demand proof that I am the Messiah's messenger? Well, I want you to know that Jesus has, has worked powerfully among you. That's what he says in these verses. It could also be translated not only among you, but in you. Because his point is that Jesus has worked mightily in your hearts, in your lives, in this church that is seeking a proof that I am a, an apostle of the Lord, and he's worked mightily through me in your lives. That's what he's saying. And so it's Christ in me. He's referring to the miracles that he performed as an apostle, the signs and wonders. He's referring to the powerful Holy Spirit anointed preaching that he had among them as the apostle. He's referring to the fact that they were saved under his ministry among them as he spent uh, time there. He's referring to the fact that through his ministry, demonic powers have been demolished. Demonic powers have, have uh, been broken and uh, have been overcome. And he says, the basis for my ministry among you is the same as it was in the ministry of Jesus. He was weak. Jesus was crucified. You might say the epitome of weakness in that, but it had a purpose. He was crucified in weakness so that he would be able to graciously bring humanity back to God's family. You realize that's what the whole redemption plan is about? Mankind went off the rails way back in the Garden of Eden. God created them for him. God created humanity for himself. God created human beings to have a special personal fellowship and relationship with himself. And sin, disobedience, rebellion destroyed that early on. And so the plan of redemption that was set in, into motion from that moment on as Genesis 3.15 and even as typified in the, in the covering of Adam and Eve with those animal skins, it's all about God seeking to bring humanity back to himself. And that requires an awful cost. That requires death. That requires the shedding of blood and none other than God coming in human form and shedding his blood and giving his life. Look, if there was any other means of you and I ever being in a right relationship with God and getting to heaven, besides the crucifixion of Jesus, then that would have been in vain. That would make the crucifixion in vain. If there is anything at all, if there is a... a uh, an infinite percentage point of being able to do something to, to merit or to earn eternal life, then Jesus died in vain. It's an all or nothing thing. He was crucified in weakness because he's seeking to bring people like you and me, the human race, back into his family that has been estranged from him, that has been separated and cut off by sin. But also... Paul says, my ministry is like Jesus, not only in that he was crucified with weakness, and you know the weakness, he, he mentioned his weakness. He talked about his weakness a lot, especially in chapter 11 and chapter 12. In chapter 12, that thorn in the flesh that made him so weak that he cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, you got to take this away. It's hindering my ministry. And Jesus said, no, no, you got it wrong, Paul. It's actually good for your ministry because now you have to completely depend upon me and you're going to find that my grace is sufficient for you. And I hope because I illustrated that and I emphasized that last Sunday morning that if you were here, that during this week when you needed God's strength, that you banked on it, that you claimed the fact, that fact that God's strength, God's power is always sufficient no matter what you face. Well, Paul says, I'm weak, just like Jesus in the crucifixion. 
But that just sets me up for resurrection power. Jesus's power was seen in the resurrection. The living Christ is at work, Paul says. That resurrected living son of God is at work giving me strength, giving me the ability. He gives strength to the strengthless. He gives power to those that have no power at all. He gives me the ability to enrich others. And so you want proof? You want proof that I'm Christ's messenger? Look at what he did through me in your life. That's what he's saying. That's his argument. Christ in me is the whole explanation, explanation Paul says, for my ministry among you. Christ in me. And then in verses 5 and 6, he talks about Christ in them. So if I could just turn the tables uh, and make personal application, you might say that uh, verses 3 and 4 is the preacher, Christ in me. And verses 5 and 6 are the congregation, Christ in you. Look at what he says in verse uh, 5. He says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. You want me to prove myself? Prove your own selves, he says. Don't you know your own selves? How that if the Messiah is in, is in you, and if he's not, you're totally disapproved. You you don't me, you don't uh, measure up unless Christ is in you. And then he says, uh, "But I trust." This is real satire. I trust that you uh, will know that we're not reprobates. You might be a reprobate. Examine yourself to see if you are. But I hope you figure out that we're not reprobate, reprobates or disapproved of God. So the emphasis here, again, relationship with Christ, not Christ in me, the preacher, but it's Christ in you, the people. And so he tells them what a real believer in Jesus is. He's not merely someone that prays a prayer to uh, get saved. A real believer in Jesus has Christ living in them. A real Christian has the living Christ living in them. And so he says, examine yourself so that you don't become self-deceived, so that you're not under deception. Is the living Christ in you? Does Christ live in you? Is there evidence? You know, the problem with these people is that they were being critical of Paul, critical of others, and they were not critical enough of themselves. They failed to examine themselves to present to prevent self-deception. You know, if you know anything about any kind of electronic device, they all have system checks built into them. Uh, because electronic devices, they need updates, they need to, to have uh, bugs worked out of them. And uh, so every ele electronic device today has a system check built into it. Or think of it this way. You can, uh, you can find online or in a doctor's office, you can find uh, health, um, what do you call it? health surveys, I guess where you can answer a whole bunch of questions and you can get an idea of just where you are health-wise. You can do a checkup that way. Well, Paul is saying, you need to do a spiritual checkup. You need to uh, examine yourself, he said. He, he's saying, you're demanding that I prove myself to be a spokesman for Christ but you are failing to test your own self, to prove your own self. You know, it's possible to look right on the outside. It's possible to uh, check all the, the right boxes as a believer and say all the right words. But what he's saying here, more important than that, is that you check yourself inwardly. Is Christ in you? Is the living Christ in you? Can it be proven that the living Christ resides in you by your daily life? If you didn't know anyone was looking, would people be able, without you knowing it, 
to observe your daily lifestyle and say, you know what? That person, that man, that woman, they are true believers. Christ lives in them. There's something supernatural, you might say, about their lifestyle. It's not uh, the normal. And so the living Christ evidenced and and uh, and active in you through you and here's the key because christ lives in you he does so with the purpose that he wants to live his life not yours he wants to live his life through you but get this he doesn't wipe out who you are and your personality christ lives in you to live his life through you as you as you he wants Christ to be seen in me, in my personality, and in yours as well. And so he's saying, check yourself. Uh, a little commentary that uh, on this had a series of questions. That I'm just going to read them real quick. But I thought that they were helpful. Here are some of the questions he says, the author of this book says, that I use in my own life. Uh, am I consciously or unconsciously creating the impression that I'm better than I really am? In other words, am I a hypocrite? Am I honest in all my acts or words, or do I exaggerate? Do I confidently pass on to another what was told me in confidence? Can I be trusted? Am I a slave to dress, fashion, or friends, work, or habits? Am I self-conscious, self-pitying, or self-justifying? Did the Bible live to me today? Do I give it time to speak to me every day? Am I enjoying a prayer life? When did I last speak to someone else with the object of trying to win them to Christ? Am I making contacts with other people and using them for God's glory? Do I pray about the money I spend? Uh, do I go to bed in time to get up in time? Do I disobey God in anything? Do I insist upon some, uh, uh, doing something about which my conscience is uneasy? Am I defeated in any part of my life, jealous, impure, critical, irritable, touchy, or distrustful? How do I spend my spare time? Am I proud? Do I thank God that I am not as other people? Is there anybody whom I fear, dislike, disown, criticize, hold resentment toward or disregard? Do I grumble or complain constantly? Is Christ real to me? And I added one more. Do I take advantage of others, their time, their things, their abilities? Anyway, just a quick list. That, that, uh, that's a good check. That's a good self-examination. That's a good indication whether it's self living in you or Christ living in you. And then in verse uh, seven and eight, as he gives this warning, as he puts up the caution flag before this church in admonishing them, he talks in verses three and four, Christ in me, talks in uh, five and six, Christ in you. And then in verses seven and eight, Here's what he says. Now, I pray to God that you do no evil. Not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. What he's talking about here, as far as this warning about your relationship with Christ, he wants them to understand that Christ is for you. Not only in you, but he's for you. And the apostle does not care about his personal reputation. That's what he says in verse 7. I don't care if, you, if people think I'm a reprobate. He knows he's not. But he says, if the Corinthians are doing right, then I don't care if I get a favorable verdict about myself. What I care about is that you're rightly related with God, that you understand Christ is in you and that he's, uh, he is for you. And in verse 8, he's just saying, all I care about is I want the truth of God to prevail. Doesn't matter what my reputation is, but I want God's truth to prevail. And I want it to be evident in your life.
that Christ is for you. And then in verses 9 and 10, he says this, For we are glad when we are weak, there it is again, and you're strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. Therefore, I write these things, though I'm not with you, I'm absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Here's the fourth way in which he's talking about the relationship that he and the people have with Christ. It's not, uh, he's not talking about Christ in you or Christ for you, but in these two verses, he's talking about you with Christ. Are you with Christ? All he wants, <laughs> all he wants in verse nine is these believers, notice he uses the word per, per, uh, perfection. Don't misunderstand that. He doesn't, he, he's not talking about sinless. He's not looking for a sin. Any preacher knows there's no such thing as a sinless congregation. There's no such thing as a perfect Christian. There's no such thing as a perfect church. You know the saying, right? If you ever find one, don't join it because that'll ruin it. But the fact of the matter is, this word perfection is a very interesting word. It's it's translated when Jesus was calling the 12, he called a couple of them that were fishermen, right? And when he found them, they were mending their nets. That's the word perfection. He says, what I, what I want from you is I want your, your nets mended. I want your lives mended is what he's referring to. It's, it's also used in the scripture as a reference to setting a dislocated bone. So you're at a joint, uh, in certain areas in your life, I all I care about is that you you're restored. It's the same thing that that uh, uh, Paul says in Galatians: if if any man is overtaken in a fault, he that is spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. That word restore is the word perfection here. Same word, and so he's called. He said, "There's only one thing I want." And that is, I want to see you restored. I, I, want, uh, I want made right what's wrong in your lives, in your church. And he says, that's the reason I'm going to confront you. That's the only reason I'm going to correct you. Because I want to restore you into a right relationship with Christ. And you know, you can resist that, obviously. People can resist that, and as a result in resisting, then God can't work in that person's life. And you know what's sad? Sometimes when a person resists God restoring them and, and uh, mending their net, it often has a negative impact upon a group corporately as well. This is why it's very important that we are rightly related to the Lord. Are you with Christ? <laughs> is basically what his, his desire is when he speaks to these people. All right, that's the admonishment. Makes sense, doesn't it? Based upon what he knows about these people, what's going on. I mean, he would be remiss if he did not warn them, if he did not talk to them straightforward like that about their, their attitudes and their behavior. But... As I said, he ends on a positive note. He ends with encouragement. So we're going to pick it up in verse 11. He said, finally, and he means I'm ready to close the letter. Finally, brethren, any question whether he's talking to Christians? Yes, these, these people with the bad attitudes and bad behavior, they're believers. Yep, believers can live in the flesh. Believers can live according to their own desires, even though Christ is in them, they can put a roadblock up to Christ living through them. And so he says, finally, brethren, farewell. Now, <laughs> you, you think he's just saying goodbye? See you later? No. Actually, that word farewell is a, a word that can be translated rejoice. Same word. Be joyful is what he said. 
He's calling this congregation to celebrate all that Christ is in you, to you, for you, with you. Celebrate that. Rejoice in that. Be joyful about that. That is an inward encouragement. But now his encouragement is outward to others. And here's what he says in the next uh, phrase in verse 11. Be perfect. Oh, there's our word again. What he means is mend your ways. <laughs> Take care of, of business. Take care of, of matters that are that are uh, that are out of sorts. Mend your ways. Pull yourselves together. He's calling on them to be restored. Okay. I would not prefer to deal with it when I get there. So take care of it now. Be perfect. That is, make restoration. And then he says in the 11th verse, be of good comfort. And the word comfort there is the word that means encouragement. <clears throat> Encourage one another. Did you know that one of the main tasks of fellowship in a local church like this, why we come together is that we could not only worship the Lord, but we can be an encouragement to one another, a spiritual encouragement to one another. And sometimes if you ask people, uh, how are you doing? They'll say, oh, I'm fine, but they're really not. People come to a congregation and services like this, not just to hear from God's word, but also to get encouragement from the brothers and sisters in the Lord. Don't forget that. Don't just uh, chow down your, your sandwich at lunch. Realize that you're here to be an encouragement to each other. So don't talk with food in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Encourage each other in the things of the Lord. You know what? Maybe you don't have anything to, to encourage people because you haven't been encouraged in the Lord. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Remember David when he was so at the end of his rope and uh, his men were talking about killing him because of what happened to their families and their things. And the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Encourage yourself, first of all, in the Lord your God. And then ask God to give you encouragement from your brothers and sisters as well. But go to God first for your encouragement. So he says, uh, basically, be encouraged, be a good comfort. And then after that, in verse 11 of 2 Corinthians 13, he says, be of one mind or be of the same mind. That is so important for a congregation. We need to be on the same spiritual page. We need to have one mind, and that is the mind of Christ. If you're a believer, you have the mind of Christ, but often we don't even tap into it. We ignore the mind of Christ, but we possess the mind of Christ and all the wisdom that that would uh, uh, deliver to us. He says, be of the same, be of one mind, be of the same, live and work together in agreement and in harmony. And then he says this in verse 11, live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. In other words, be of the same mind, live and work together in harmony. And if you'll do this, you know what? You'll sense God's presence among you. And when you do, you can claim his enabling fruit of the spirit to make it possible to fulfill everything that I've said, all that I've mentioned. The encouragement is first inward, be joyful. Then it's outward in verse 14. I should say, verses 12 and 13 are just saying, look, love one another. It's just another way of saying love one another, okay? Doesn't mean that we got to go around kissing uh, one another. But uh, I don't have a problem with uh, ladies kissing uh, their sisters in Christ. I have a problem with men kissing their sisters in Christ, okay? Or sisters kissing their brothers in Christ. It's just say, love one another. And if you're the same mind, the love of the brethren is what he's talking about in verses 12 and 13. Just simple as that. 
you love your brother. You know what? Love covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> you'll overlook you'll overlook some things. You won't be a critic. You won't be uh, hip, you won't be self righteous. You'll be compassionate towards your brothers and sisters because we aren't perfect, right? Because we're all in the process of being sanctified. It's not a justification for living a low life, but it is the reality of uh, the Christian family that we are members of. And then in verse 14, here I say the encouragement isn't inward or outward, it's upward. See it? In verse 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, that's the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Now, do you see anything significant about that? There are three persons mentioned there, right? There you have the triunity of God. This is a this is a, a proof text, you might say, for the triunity of God. We sang holy, holy, holy. Blessed Trinity. The triunity of God is here. The grace of the Messiah, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The grace of Jesus, that is, Jesus is the one that manifests grace to us. You know what grace is? It is totally undeserved. It is God, it's Jesus' overwhelming generosity. It is his astonishing commitment to us, and it is his supernatural enablement. That's his grace, and it is brought to us, notice, it is exercised by the love of God or the Father. Remember this, that it's the Father who provided this great reconciliation that we have. It's the Father that decided not to spare his own son, but rather deliver him up for us all. And as a result, we can experience then the, the participation. That's what the word communion means the participation or the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. We can experience the fellowship with the Holy Spirit who created such a wonderful, inexpressible fellowship that we have with God. We can enter into a continual deep participation or fellowship with the Lord. Coming to know the one and true God, in and through Jesus of Nazareth, his crucifixion, he the resurrected one, and coming to know this God, which is eternal life, is what John says, and this Holy Spirit, and develop a, a real friendship with the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't know if you know this saying, you know, that person in, in that family is like a redheaded stepchild. You know, you know that saying, you know, you follow me? Maybe not. That means uh, he's, he's like distant from the rest of the family. They, they don't pay attention to that person. He doesn't get the same level of affection and the same level of attention. Well, I feel that that is often the way that Christians treat the Holy Spirit. Like he's just a force or just some type of spiritual energy. No, the Holy Spirit, if you know the Bible, is just as much a person as the Father and the Son are. And as I understand it, uh, if, if, a, if a being is a person, then we're supposed to have a relationship with them. And I think that we've kind of, uh, we've cut off the Holy Spirit and we can't develop a personal relationship with him because we've overreacted to some extremes regarding the ministry and the person of the Holy Spirit. And that's sad because when you don't have a personal friendship and relationship with the Holy Spirit, you don't have access to the power of God because he's the person in the triunity that makes God's power available to us as individuals. And so we need to develop just as much a friendship with the Holy Spirit as we might have with Abba or with uh, our elder brother, Yeshua, Jesus. 
Well, most Christians never reach the level of Christian living or intimacy with God that uh, Paul is talking about here in that 14th verse. Most believers really shrink back from getting too close because they're happy to just have a surface level relationship with God. You know why? Because if you want to go deeper with God, it's going to require you to humble yourself and to submit to the Lord. Because if you want a deeper relationship with Christ, it means you're going to have to learn to say no to yourself. Don't we teach our kids to say no to themselves? And yet we hardly ever say no to it. We do what we feel like doing. We go where we want to go. We buy what we want to buy. We eat what we want to eat. Uh, we make all these selfish decisions. You'll never go deep with God until you learn to say no to yourself, until you learn to deny yourself. In fact, the very essence, the very core of a believer in Jesus, as I began with in the introduction, is not what you say you believe. But how you live, that reveals what you really believe. And so there's a question that each of us must answer. And it's simply this. Am I living it? Am I living a genuine believing life in which the living Christ in me is living his life in and through me as me? When people observe my life, do they get any impression that Christ is at work in me? Do they see any evidence that he's in me? Am I living it? That's the question I want to leave us with to consider.